Welcome to The Horror Hangout, a podcast where film fans watch the best and worst horror movies of all time and talk about them. My name is Ben Errington, and today I'm joined by a very special guest. Amber T is a writer, lotus eater, and dungeoness of Horn Blood Fire and Fang Bangers podcasts, as well as a lover of the gory, gruesome, bizarre, and bleak. Welcome to the show, Amber. Thank you very much for having me, Ben. It's great to be here. Hello, welcome. How are you doing? How are you doing today? I'm very good, thank you. Um, very cold, as we've just spoken about a little bit off mic. Um, so hopefully by the yeah. end of our chat, I will have um, hot, heated up a bit, which I'm sure heated up just bit. slightly, <laughs> straight like, off the bat with a I word like to... that doesn't exist. <laughs> I love to chuck in the words that don't exist. They're fun. I like to insist on at least a degree of of heating up uh, by the, oh, by the yeah. beginning and the end of this podcast. Just oh, one degree. Yeah. I don't want anyone to get <laughs> colder. Go crazy. No, I don't want anyone to get colder from talking to me. You know <laughs> that would be a disaster. Um, yeah, no, Andy. This week, um, he is he's turned into a metal man and floated off down <laughs> down. Where is he? He's in Perth. He's in Perth in Scotland. He's uh, floated off down the road at superhuman speed, um, unfortunately. So we wish him the best, and uh, he'll be back next week, I'm sure. (laughs) Godspeed, quite literally. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, thanks for joining us, uh, Amber. It's been a little while. We've wanted to get you on the show for for a number number of months now, and we're so lucky to have you on the show, um, finally. And to talk about one of your favourites as well, which is always a good time. Yes, absolutely. I'm so pleased to be here. This is actually the first time I've ever spoken about this film on a podcast. Um, which okay. I'm, I'm actually surprised it's taken me this long. Um, but yeah, very excited to get into it. Mm, yeah, and there is lots and lots to get into because what will be interesting about this conversation is that this is one of your favourite films and mm-hmm. it's the first time I've ever seen this film. So I guess it will be different to... It'll be interesting to see how our points of view differ and what the film means to you, mm-hmm. as well as the lasting impact it's going to have on me. I think it is going to be a lasting impact, to be fair. Because um, I watched it quite late, you know. Um, it was kind of like, okay, it's only, what was it, like an hour and a bit. Yeah, it's very short. It's very short, yeah. So I thought, mm-hmm. I can squeeze this in before I go to sleep. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> was that the best idea i don't know i think i had some some kind of weird dreams maybe some clanking going on in my head <laughs> yeah and like life Tim is Fo- like pre tetsuo and after tetsuo oh, i feel like there's okay. a defining okay. moment in everyone's life when they have seen this film and it's like, like you said it's only an hour an hour and a bit long um but it's a game changer mm, yeah how do you feel about films that, that have a much less running time Oh, I love it. Honestly, oh, you love it. Okay. okay. I love. I love. I think you know it gets said a lot now that a lot of horror films are pushing the the two hour uh, mm. time limit. And I I recently actually this weekend I watched Bones and All um by Luca Guadagno oh, and wow, okay. that was two two and a half hours. I want to say it might have not been that long, but it felt like that long. Um, and. I just th- I just don't know that many stories that have enough going on to carry on for two and a half hours. I mean, we're only human at the end of the day. First of all, I've got to go to the yeah. bathroom halfway through. Mm. That annoys me. Um, so, yeah, when I see a good like 90 minute or less movie, I'm very excited for it. I mm. love it. I have to, I think we've spoken about on this podcast before. Like the apps, the absolute sweet spot is 85 minutes. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice, isn't it? Yeah. When I see a film's 85 minutes, I'm like, hell yeah. I guess Bones and All is like, I guess like, it's not straight up horror, is it? It's kind of... It's actually... I w- okay, so I, li- I did like it, but I, I, th- I feel like the marketing kind of missold it because I thought it was going to be very much more... Not not horror but I thought it was going to be a lot more gory and a lot more violent than it actually was. Um, But mm, I would... Okay. I don't know if I would even class it as horror. I guess technically it is, but it's not scary. It's It's romantic and... I guess the cannibalism in itself is the horror part of it, but not much mm. else. Just a bit of cannibalism, you just know. Just a little bit. Uh, just a little bit. Uh, yeah. So eighty-five minutes. I don't, I don't know if you did. You see Terrifier two? I well? did. That was too long as well. <laughs> that was inc- incredibly long. That was, that that was, was what was that? Two hours long. and way yeah, too long. It... I liked it, but I like I like the concept. I like Terrifier. I like Art the Clown. I thought it was mm. brutal. I thought it was really mean. 
don't need to be two and a half hours long. No. There's not enough there. There's absolutely not enough there. There's no, no. storyline. No. <laughs> Clown rips some and skin off your back. I, yeah, and they're trying to make it all with this like magic sword and this whole final girl thing. And I'm like, don't, come on, yeah. two and a half hours is too Great final long. girl though, right? Yeah, she was she was cool. I liked her a lot. Um, mm. I wish she'd stop talking to people on Twitter because she's getting wound up by trolls yeah, left, right, and I've center, and I feel actually, terrible yeah. for her. Like people are just being complete assholes mm. to her. Um, and she's still, mm. she, I think she's quite a young actress, so hopefully that doesn't put her off interacting mm. with people. Yeah, as it would, as Twitter often does, put you off yeah. interacting with anybody. Oh yes. Uh, but yeah, that film was too long. I watched it in two. Um, two sessions really because mm-hmm. i think i just got to a point where i was like a little bit because it is exhausting isn't it like yeah just you hit constant. your wall um and i think because there's no storyline um well there is a storyline but <laughs> you know an hour goes past you're like oh great i could watch this guy dismember women all day and then it turns out you can't do that <laughs> everyone <laughs> has their limit with art the clown everyone has them <laughs> you think you can and then suddenly you can't you, you can't. can't no i just want to go to bed with my hot water I bottle i know and, uh, i want to go to bed with peter rabbit <laughs> oh, oh, the clown leave me alone <laughs> jesus uh yeah so i guess first of all we'll talk about um your podcasts because there are more than one now aren't there so there the are. blood fire podcast mm. and the fang bangers podcast which is mm-hmm. Just about True Blood, right? It's not. It's about... just True Blood. Yeah, it's okay. just, we we wanted to go um, because my main one because Hornblood Fire is is quite in depth and we go into movies for much longer and you know talk about histories and background and all kinds of things. But for for Fang Bangers, we wanted it just fun, like we wanted it. So they're like thirty minute episodes. <laughs> they're purely just rewatch. We recap the episode, and it's it's cheesy and it's it's great fun. Um, I recorded about five of them in person with Claire when I went to LA this summer and oh, wow. because I okay. yeah that was which was so much fun. It was amazing, and we're about to start again soon now that I have my internet back. Um. But yeah, very different. Two very different podcasts. So Horn Blood Fire is more sort of in depth, and it doesn't yeah. cover just one sort of side of the horror genre, does it? It does cover. It seems to cover quite a lot. Of... Well, originally I I thought it was just going to end up being horror, and then we did me and Zoe um Zoba with Shotgun. We did A Clockwork Orange was the first episode of the new season, yeah. and then you know that's not a horror film at all yeah. i have a couple others lined up that you would also not really call horror so i i've started to i guess branch it out a bit um i will always cover films that are horrifying in a way or have like mm. a horror adjacentness to them a thriller or um mm. a very dark film but yeah just trying to branch out a little bit i'm never going to yeah. do a romance film or like a drama or a comedy or anything though i just <laughs> that's not my thing that's not my cup of tea. Nah. Uh, it's all got to be as as in your description of the show: gory, gruesome, bizarre, and bleak, or all or like combinations of those four things. Uh, yeah, one of those things or another. Yeah, and that's mm-hmm. that's good. I think like on this show we try to put fun front and center. That sounds mm-hmm. a bit sounds kind of silly. Uh, <laughs> we've tried to put fun front that's and center, very but then sometimes, the clown. but then sometimes we like decide to watch a film and then we realize, you know what? We can't really make that many jokes about this. For example, last week we watched Last House on the Left, which I another one I'd not seen. And, you know, in terms of like rape revenge movies, mm. yeah, you can't, there's not many jokes to be had. I mean, <laughs> not, not many good terms. Not for nice anybody. jokes anyway. <laughs> there are zero nice jokes. And, you know, if, if you can't be nice with your jokes, what's the point of joking at all? Exactly. Uh, so, so that was, uh, that was pretty tough and i think we've done that a few times before we had we had zobo on the show um a little while ago to do cannibal holocaust and you know there are plenty of jokes to make about that but yeah when you see the version which has got all the animal cruelty in it yeah. also hard watch pretty hard watch so yeah um i don't want to chuck tetsu or the iron man into that category of films you can't have fun about because we'll we'll try and have a little bit of fun about it there's a lot of phallic imagery <laughs> You know? there's, there's some fun parts in it, you know, sewage oh, pipe. Yeah. <laughs> sewage pipe, phallic imagery. No one, nothing's yeah. better than a dick joke. Uh, exactly. Nothing. And uh, and the soundtrack as well. The music is, is jarring. Mm-hmm. It does slap. Um, it's very, 
it's very like industrial metal meets just like the foley artist has just gone off his nut yeah and and then there's a random like nice cute little jazz pop song inserted here and there which reminds me of like doing karaoke in japan at like three o'clock in the morning oh wow um and it kind of like i've never been to japan you've been to japan so you can tell Mm -hmm. me if i'm if i'm incorrect or not but it felt like very grand level in terms of like japan Reminded me of um, Shenmue, the game, a little bit, where you kind of like wander around the streets and... I haven't played that, sorry. Okay, <laughs> I don't know sorry. what that is. It's, uh, it's basically like a Japanese set, sort of like um, adventure game, but it's oh, okay. very much like modern Japan um, mm-hmm. in sort of like suburbia and like the yes. city and stuff. And it felt like that. It felt like a very grand level Japanese film. You're kind of like get going down alleyways in garages and the subway station and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a side of Japan that a lot of people who haven't lived in Japan might not know about. Because I think usually when we see Japan, especially Tokyo or Osaka on on films or, or TV, it's always like the big mm. the high rises, the skyscrapers, the neon lights. Um, but actually, you know, like any city in the world, Japan does uh, any city in the world, any country in the world, Japan does have these little urban neighborhoods, mm. which have mundane parts to them, like any place in the world and I, I love that Tetsuo like goes there and shows you like down those places that you might not be familiar with if you're not from exactly Japan, you've never been there it was great I love that though because sometimes like I mean I don't know if you do this I certainly do when I see somewhere in a film or maybe on a tv show or maybe just in general someone talking about something I get my get straight on the google maps street oh, view yeah. Yeah, have yeah, a little yeah. look about it it felt I, like... I go to my old neighborhood in Japan on, on Street View all the time. I just walk around okay, there. So you, like, so you actually it. lived in Japan? I did, yes. I lived in Japan for two years. Um, wow, okay. 2000 and... Beep, I can't remember. <laughs> but yeah, I did, I did live there. <laughs> I'll just fill it in afterwards. When you tell I've me later, I've lived in a lot I'll of places, it so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, if you're like, um, LA two weeks ago, uh, Japan whenever and now leads now leads <laughs> very glamorous lifestyle that i lead i mean it's a lot more places than i've lived it's uh so <laughs> um okay also i wanted to talk to you about uh your newsletter as well because your newsletter seems to be very popular i subscribe to that newsletter it's, <laughs> it's very i'm very excited whenever it, whenever it uh, oh, arrives you. in my inbox so can you tell us a little bit about that and what, if anyone subscribes to it, what they could um, expect from, from that? Oh, yeah. So basically, I I can't even remember. What, okay, so I made the newsletter, I think, at the um, beginning of this year because I'm subscribed to Alison Pierce, um, Dr. Alison Pierce, who wrote Women Make Horror. She's a fantastic academic um, who works in the horror space, does a lot of, you know, um as the book suggests women in horror but she also does a lot of horror from around the world she works with a lot of academics and scholars from asia and um other countries like places like india so horrors that we might not be familiar with um and she has a fantastic newsletter called the losers club which Mm -hmm. i love getting every sunday she sends that out and i just remember reading it one day i was like this is just nice to read it's it's like I feel like so much of the time in, in horror, the horror space, we, we're all on Twitter together or we're all on Instagram. So we're, we're talking in these short little bursts, like mm. like little tweets or whatever that can often get misconstrued. And I was like, well, sometimes I have more to say than that. Um, and it's sometimes not stuff that I want to put on the podcast. I had a lot of things like I really wanted to write about top 10 Japanese shorts that I liked. Um or like I do like character shout out and update people on what I've been watching. And it's really just because I love the sound of my own voice. No, it's basically because I like to talk. I like talking. And I thought, yeah. well, if I write all this down, maybe someone will find it interesting. And it's gotten a, a lot of like a lot of people have expressed interest, which to me is great. Like, I love it. And mm. I try to give someone a different like a shout out every week because there are so many amazing people that I've gotten to know in horror and through Twitter and I just wanted to make those people realize that I love them and I appreciate them and like you know spread the word about what they're doing so yeah it's nice I really like doing it it takes a lot more work than I thought it would 
So I yeah. am quite delayed. I do try and get one out every two weeks. And if you do want to subscribe, then you can expect little listicles and I give you a rundown of what I've been watching, what I've been reading and some some hot takes in there that I don't want to say on Twitter as well. The hottest <laughs> takes there are. <laughs> Scolding hot takes. Um, I will put the link to, to, your, to your newsletter in Thank the show you. notes as well as long as the links to um your podcasts and we can we can direct our listeners to that um and the last thing i wanted to chat about before we sort of jump into some other bits are uh, you recently attended grim fest is that correct i did well i i didn't go to the actual festival i went to they um they did a collaboration with the bfi who this okay. year have done uh in dreams are monsters which is a season of horror movies across the different places in the uk none in cornwall of course um, but grim fest did a little weekend called move uh monsters and movies which they basically had saturday and sunday was full of you know classic monster movies we watched we had an american werewolf in london um the 4k restoration of the thing um oh, okay. sleepwalkers oh, wow. yeah um Sleepwalker, sleepwalkers yeah. which um i used to not like and now i love it um the descent <laughs> um neil marshall's new film the lair which sadly i didn't get to see because i had to run for my train but yeah neil marshall was there mick garris was there um corinne hardy was there alice krieger was there it was loads of like really amazing horror people came uh reese shearsmith was there and they did like amazing panels oh, okay. reese and mick did recorded a live episode of mick's podcast and it was a blast it was so much fun and i'm still kind of new to doing these like in-person horror events because there was none down in the south um mm. so i'm still kind of a bit of a nervous wreck when i show up because i have massive amounts of social anxiety <laughs> and i don't know how to talk to people but it was really fun it was lovely and um i can't wait to do more stuff like that yeah i mean it sounds great i'm kind of in a similar similar boat to you and uh, yeah it's kind of like the anticipation as of going to an event like that when you're there and afterwards you're kind of like you're glad you did it oh um, definitely I'd yeah. definitely like to get to more of that um i know we're possibly going to be going to fright fest scotland um that's well, gonna fright be good fest glasgow sorry mm -hmm. um should be good so yeah uh awesome awesome okay so i guess first of all we'll dive into some horror news for the week mm. um some new stories that i've seen and we can chat about those i kind of watched a trailer for a movie just now and i was like for some reason based on the title alone which is cocaine bear <laughs> i, I thought i thought did you know i was gonna say that I, have i just yes. got a look about me where well, I, I just look <laughs> like a guy like a film called cocaine bear i thought it was gonna be like cause i know it's based on a true story i thought it was gonna be like a creature feature sort of like animal attack horror mm -hmm. thriller that's what i thought okay that's what i thought from all of the all of the marketing so far watch the trailer looks so like they've just gone for and made it a comedy which i'm kind of a bit disappointed by yeah i i have to say i'm not I'm not massively hyped about that. I, I, I'm i sure it's going to be great. I'm sure it's going to be great fun. Um, And it looks like mm. great fun. And I'm glad everyone's loving it. But I, I'm, I'm not. I'm, not <laughs> I'm huge, happy for you. I'm so happy for you guys. Uh, I'm not massively into like animal horror because um animals don't scare me um which they should because bears are fucking terrifying. Um, yeah. But no, I've just I've just never really me and animal horror have just never really gelled i guess never really um, clicked maybe you need no. to have like a like a near-death experience with an animal Probably, hopefully then... yeah that way we can get that sorted i mean the only <laughs> the only one of course is jaws hopefully. um <laughs> jaws yeah. is obviously like a perfect film um i'm mm. shit scared of sharks anyway anything in the ocean i'll tell you what if they made yeah. a horror film about whales i would Okay. be involved because i fucking i'm terrified of whales Just not anywhere. the country um <laughs> yeah all of them like <laughs> blue whales gray whales killer whales i absolutely hate them i don't killer hate whales. them like they're gentle sweet and kind animals i know that mm. but if you if i ever had to see a whale in person i would die because yeah, everyone's like thinks it's magic don't they when the tail like comes out the <clears throat> comes out the sea Oh, I'm kind mate. of a bit like it's massive and terrifying and it's it absolutely just... terrifying. It's like I always think it's like the closest thing we'll get to like a Lovecraftian yeah. creature that's like beyond the scope because they're like the blue whale is the biggest living thing ever that's like yeah. ever lived, which to me is like insane. 
Um, so I don't want to be anywhere near you that. You can swim down. You can swim down its bloodstream. All right, I that's just want, too big. I don't want that. I don't want any <laughs> part of that. So it if might... they made a <laughs> film about flying, well, actually there was a there was one of the very few Chinese horror movies I've ever seen called Mission to Mars, where it was absolutely goddamn terrible. Um, they oh, sure. they do a mission to Mars, but there is actually like a flying space whale in that. And I was like, okay, this movie is memorable for that very reason. It was flying terrifying. space whale. Mission yeah. To Mars. Okay. Yeah, I think that's what it was called. Sounds pretty scary. I mean, whales are scary, but it reminds me of that bit in Pinocchio. Well, that's what that in its, literally up in its yes. belly. That that is why I'm scared of whales. Is because when I was little, I saw that. And you know, formative memories and such. Loads of horrible stuff in Pinocchio. You know, loads of things yeah. that have shaped. Yeah, don't get swallowed up. So basically, cocaine bear. I was hoping it was going to be an animal attack horror movie, but it's not. It's just a comedy. Um, and you know, I don't know if that's what I'm going to want to go and watch at the cinema. But I mean, who? The tagline is "Get in line." That's. That's kind of funny, I guess. <laughs> but right. I feel like cocaine has like there's way more funnier puns. I can't think of any at the top of my head. Um, I think Phil Phil Noble Jr., who is the editor in chief of Fangoria, he just tweeted like "Yay Yogi Bear," which I thought was hilarious. Like it, it's <laughs> okay. very like it's very niche, but I thought yeah. that was way funnier. <laughs> You're directed by Elizabeth Banks as well. That I don't understand. That's kind of a left field, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Kind of odd. Okay, what else have we got? Um, Mo- uh, M. Night Shyamalan's new movie, Knock at the Cabin. It's got a poster. You can see yeah. everybody holding different load of weapons. Batista, he's in it. Um, obviously, it's based on the novel by Paul Tremblay, but I saw him retweet the poster and he said, one thing's missing from this poster, and it seems to be that it's got no distinct His name connection. isn't in it, yeah. Um, and obviously, it's got a different name to the book as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I haven't, I've never read the book, and I'm not hugely familiar with the story. Um, I just to cover my own ass, I did put him when I wrote the news article for Fango about a knock at the cabin. I did say it was by him, so I'm covered. Um, so but in a I way, have, you're better have... than M. Night Shyamalan, <laughs> is what you're saying. In a way, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I respect. didn't direct the visit, so let's just say maybe I am deserving of more. <laughs> there we go. Um, no, Wait, no, are you, no. Are you, are you a visit hater? Oh, I hate. I, I mean, I. Me too. Me okay, too. I, no hate to M. Night. He's, you know, he's had a banger or one. A banger. <laughs> a banger. Had, Singular yeah, banger. He's had Two six bangers. cents. He's had the six cents. Six cents, all right. Unbreakable's better. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I don't like um. I don't like that whole trilogy thing that he did. Um. Mm. I'm just oh, not. Yeah. I'm not a huge fan of his work. I think he's a great person, and I respect the shit out of him as well because he loves horror so much, and he mm. funds all his own. All everything comes from his own pocket, and he's so imaginative. Um. But his stuff just doesn't land with me. Um. Mm. I hated old. I did uh, not like the visit. The beach that makes you turn old. Yeah. The beach that makes you turn old. Um, yeah, I wasn't particularly into that. The no. visit really, really bothered me. And what bothered me the most about the visit, they don't want to shit on the guy, but what bothered me the most about the visit was that everyone else seemed to be pretty into it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't get it either. I, I mean, I think it came in that whole time where it was like, oh, old people are scary, um, <laughs> which, yeah, which is yeah. very, is very silly. But there, there's going, a lot. That's still going on though. X this year. It is, it's but I think happening. X is X is kind of. Have you seen Pearl? Yeah. So I think X, when you watch X w- in relation to Pearl, I think it's, I think, because mm. I, I love X, but I know a lot of people are a bit annoyed. They were like, oh, it's it's saying that old people are disgusting and especially like old women and old mm. women's bodies are like inherently scary and repulsive, which isn't the case, obviously. But I feel mm. like with if you put X and Pearl together, it, the story makes more sense. Once you know who yeah. Pearl is, um, it's less like oh she's old and scary it's like oh she's, she's scary because Jesus. we knew we know who she is and we know what she wanted to be and, and also like, like what she ended X, up in x it's almost like the fact that an older woman's got like a sexual appetite was kind of treated in a way that was like what she's well, got what i know that this is what i this is what i didn't get about x yes there's a sex scene between two old people i don't think ty west made it funny or like oh it's disgusting they just have sex 
everyone mm. else was like, oh my God, what the fuck yeah. is old people I mean, on this? So it's like, well, that's your reaction to it. <laughs> he's not making that reaction. Yeah. He's just he's just putting it out there, you know, whatever reaction you have. That's exactly. your own business. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pearl, I think, has got a UK release date now, which is, what is it, like, five years' time or something? Yeah, yeah, 2050. We'll have it. Oh, oh my God. What's it's... going on? I don't know. I don't know what's going on this year. I don't know if I'm just more sensitive to it this year, but I feel like... No, no. So I feel like not. it started first with Crimes of the Future, the Cron- the new Cronenberg movie, and I think the US got that in February? It was yeah. definitely it was definitely yeah. early, and then we got it in September, and then nope, they in America they got nope yeah. really early. And I know weeks. like the US is a much more profitable market, and it's huge. Like it's it's not comparable to the UK, but come on, I think really, it's, it's, I think it's an aftermath of. It feels like to me that it's an aftermath of COVID. Somehow, some mm-hmm. like stu- studios are not wanting to do so much of an international push for certain films for some reason for fear of losing money um, yeah because i think it kind of that difference in release dates didn't exist for a long time and it only feels like now obviously yeah those examples you gave crimes of the future and pearl barbarian was another one no yeah oh, oh, you did say that sorry um but yeah it feels like it's only in the last couple of years that i've really noticed a difference because even sometimes in the uk like some people come out before the us even if mm. it was just a number of days yeah but because all the big, all the big films, all of the big sort of tentpole releases and blockbusters are still being released. It just seems to be the genre films mm-hmm. that are getting a little bit of a shafting. It's so weird as well because I feel like we got X this year at the same time as mm. the US did. Because I remember going to see it at the same time yeah. as American Friends were. So something along the line went wrong with Pearl. I don't know what. Maybe one day we'll find out. I don't care because I've seen it. Um, yeah, <laughs> I will. Yeah. I will go and see it in the cinema just to financially, you know, show up for it. But um, yeah. I have financially yeah. shown up for it, but I have used the VPN to watch it because a lot of people have. Hmm. You know, it's yeah. And it, when you feel like you've got no choice and you've got to do something like that, then exactly. Because you want to see the film, you want to support it financially, but also you don't want it spoiled by someone else, mm-hmm. some other shit muncher mm-hmm. going. Oh, I've seen this and this will happen. No, no. Well, that's the thing is like on Twitter after three days of Pearl's release, everyone was talking about yeah, Halloween ends as well. I don't give a shit about Halloween. I don't didn't like any of it, but except the first mm. one and the third one. But the new one, I know how important that franchise is to people. And I was seeing spoilers like three days yeah. later. I was like, that's mm. really fucked up. That's, you know, this is a franchise that means a lot to a lot of people. Um, Even so, like yeah. memes, memes about context. Sometimes mm-hmm. I'm like, I, I feel like I can work that out. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I remember when Men, Alex Garland's Men, came out this year and yeah. someone... Have you seen Have you seen it? Because I, I won't spoil it. I've seen Men, yeah. And okay. we did, we have done an episode, so if, if there are any constant listeners... I'm a um, defender of Men, so... Yeah. Big fan. Oh, no, but... I've, seen, I've, seen you, I've seen your tweet about defending <laughs> Men so, yeah, on more than, seen... one, more than one occasion. <laughs> But I want to tell you, I absolutely, yeah, I like it. I like men. That's good. Good to hear. I think men gave me one of the most visceral reactions to a horror movie of the year, I would say. Yeah, it's great. With... I mean, it's fantastic. Yeah, we, we like we like men. It was we, love, although, we love. We <laughs> love. Although, Rory Kinnear, his face reminds me so much of uh, Matt Hancock. Oh shit! It, it, it Why really did, did it really did bother me like the whole film because yeah. I imagined I imagined the world mm-hmm. where Matt Hancock's face was on every man, mm-hmm. maybe including me. And well, Rory it. Kinnear, God love him. I, I'm not sure what his politics are. Hopefully not, but he he does have a bit of a Tory face, and I don't know if it's just because <laughs> he played um, fake David Cameron in that episode of Black oh, Mirror yeah. where he fucked a pig. Fucked a pig, yeah. Um, but he. He does have quite a Tory face. His face has been privately educated. Oh, yeah, like, definitely. For sure. Maybe and no maybe... hate to Rory. I love him. I love him. But you... sorry, mate. No no hate to you, but you have got a <laughs> You are Tory a Tory, face. mate. <laughs> no? Where are you educated? Oh, um, <laughs> okay. What else have I got for you? Uh, oh. The Walking Dead finally came to an end, like, a couple of weeks ago. Season something. I don't know. 
Um, I knew it wasn't going to be the end because apparently there's loads and loads of spin-offs, including something called The Walking Dead, Dead City. That's you got to say the word dead twice back to Is back. Is that there. the Daryl? So there's Daryl Dixon, Daryl Dixon yeah. in Paris. Um, <laughs> what is that? That's where it's set. Daryl Dixon goes to Paris. That's where it's set. It's set in Paris. God knows how. Daryl Dixon in Paris. There's Maggie and. And, you know, That's... I haven't watched this show in 10 years, and yeah. somehow I know all this. There's Maggie and Negan's show. There's Carol having a new show. There's Rick's going to have a spin-off. Who there's cares? Spin-offs, isn't there? Who cares? Isn't there, like, there's, like, a already... Oh, didn't spin-offs already exist? Isn't there's there about like... eight spin-offs. There's Fear the Walking Dead. There's, like, a web series, Survival? which actually might be Fear the Walking Dead. Survive... Survivors of the Walking Dead. I don't know. It's too much. Mm. It's too much for a very boring universe let's be honest i mean it wasn't always boring but it definitely is boring now the Dead first City is series was a... so yeah. good um oh yeah then the second first... series sucked ass because they were all right, stuck on that farm hmm. series three was good series four i think the time i turned off was when they went to terminus I can't remember oh, when that yeah. was. Because I just remember thinking, like, how fucking stupid. Has no one in this this place taken an English class before? Like, why would you go to a place called Terminus and expect to, <laughs> like, like uh, grow up? It's like in Prometheus when they get on the ship called Prometheus and they expect good things. That, oh, grow up. Come on. It'll be, it'll be fine. It'll be, f- it'll Terminus. be fine. Terminus. Let's go on Terminus this ship says... called Death Hole. It'll just be fine. Terminus sounds lovely. Yeah. I want to go there. <laughs> uh, this dead city doesn't sound much better. Is Negan and Maggie. Kind of weird that it's Negan and Maggie, considering, I mean, I don't know how far it went into it with the show, but considering they were like mortal enemies at one Well, didn't point. he he killed Stephen Yun, which is also when I yeah. what I thought was unforgivable because, and yeah. I love, I love graphic, mean spirited stuff, but I felt, I just felt that that was just mm. nasty. I was like, that's, there's no need for that. Stephen Yeun yeah. is so cute and such a good actor, and Glenn was like the only fun part of The Walking Dead. And to kill him that That's fucking horribly, it. it was me. Bludgeoning his head. I think I, I kind of got right. It, it, it was like at its peak then, but it dropped off so quickly. Mm-hmm. Like that instance of who's Negan gonna kill? Because it kind of ended on one series or mm-hmm. maybe a mid a mid series thing. Who's Negan gonna kill? And then when it turned out to be two major characters, it was just two. And then it just dropped off completely after that. And yeah. I love Jeffrey Dean Morgan, but he I, I'm not so, so on board with this Negan performance. He's kind of constantly leaning back. Oh, he just, Yeah, he just, just does constantly. the same few ticks over and over again, doesn't he? I like him too, but he, yeah. he's he's got his, his things that work and he knows that they work. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, there's a trailer for that. If anybody wants to go and check that out, if you want, you know, Cocaine Bear trailer. I'm not giving people many many good choices here, unfortunately. <laughs> but, um, and then also, there's a new game out this week called the Callisto Protocol, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, kind of looks a bit like I don't know. If you, have you seen anything of this, Amber? No, I'm really not on it with game horror games. Not on it with games. Okay. No, but, yeah. I no am going to get. I am getting a PlayStation Five at Christmas. So. Oh yeah. Um, how, do you, yeah. how do you know Santa Claus would know that <laughs> no, well, I am you. my own fucking Santa Claus <laughs> that's how I, I need, know I don't need a big bloke right a big <laughs> bloke classiest bloke because he gives b- better Christmas presents than rich kids that's um, me I am my own Santa yeah it's good it's good to be your own Santa you could sit on your own knee you could try men you could try Bit of Rory can hear for you there, sitting on your own, coming out of your own self, your own asshole. I like that kind it. Of thing. Coming out of your own asshole, birthing <laughs> yourself for Christmas. Um, the Callisto Protocol. It kind of looks like Dead Space, so it's basically like um, a haunted house mm-hmm. in space scenario. Um, looks like a bit like Alien. I, I'm okay. not so sure about it. It feels like it feels like a, it's got a huge, but a huge budget gone into it because the graphics are unbelievable. Like they've popped. What's his name? Josh du- Duhamel? That, that dude? You recognise his face, probably. I recognise his face. They've popped a picture of him next to like his in-game mo- character model, and you can't mm. tell the difference. So I feel like all of the all of the um, budget's gone into that, um, mm. so I don't know how it's going to play. I'm probably not, not going to get it, because we're getting a Dead Space remake as well in January, so... That's uh, that's good. I reckon, I'll put I reckon that on the list. Stick it on the list, um, definitely. 
Do you think you get so jumping into PlayStation? Are you going to be getting get into horror games? Do you think? Or um. Just... So I really, I I played The Last of Us Two, which I really mm. enjoyed. Um, mostly I'm getting. I mean, it's not just me that's getting it. I'm obviously sharing it. Um, with who I live with, but I. <laughs> really am waiting for silent hill f to come out um i don't know if you saw the trailer for that but oh yes i did that's not gonna be out for like five years i don't care i'm ready silent hill f the one in like 16th century no it's set in 1960s japan um, oh, 90. <laughs> I like it. I've really gone back in time. <laughs> there was a six there. Is there it was a set, six there. The 16th century? <laughs> no, it's but not. yeah, so it is that one. Um, and I am going to be sat in front of the PlayStation, patiently waiting for it until it comes out. And I will probably play the remake of Silent Hill 2 as well. Um, mm. And I would like to play, a lot of people have been telling me I should play Outlast. Um, I don't know what that is, and it's probably going to kill me. Yeah, Outlast is more like a a very intense horror experience, like um, constantly fighting for your life, constantly hiding from, and you can't fight back. So I think if you play like The Last, I mean, I prefer games like The Last of Us where, sure, it's scary, but your means of survival are, you know, they're there. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, we got loads of Silent Hill announcements, didn't we? We did, yeah. And I am a Silent Hill 2 diehard die hard fan like played it back in the back in the day um and i'm i'm looking forward to the remake i'm not going to be really you know pessimistic about it i'm my hopes are not high but leveled <laughs> so we'll it's, a good, it's a good way to approach life i think mm-hmm. uh my hopes are just this just on an even keel all right mm-hmm. yeah. i'm just expecting I'm just expecting, and then I won't be disappointed if it's exactly. crap. I think it's, I think it's going to be great because I think that they've looks like they've really taken the, the vibe in terms of like the visuals, the soundtrack, uh, the gameplay, and probably mm-hmm. just given it a, a twenty twenty three when it will come out. Lick of paint. So. Yeah, I mean, I think I have it on authority that they have not and will not and are not allowed to change any of the story and any of the, yeah. the like the game beats so it's literally just going to be a retooling for a modern um, yeah. console watch i say this and it's going to come out and like james is going to be <laughs> like not crazy and nothing i'm not going to spoil it but... i mean james does look very different and i was a bit like Ooh, he I looks very like different um yeah but i don't think he looks bad I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Did you play? I always like bringing this up. Silent Hill Four. The Room. Yeah. Yes, that was the last time I really was in. So I only really liked Silent Hill One to Four, which is like the team yeah. when Team Silent were um, mm. in the development of it. Um, anything after that, I did play. What's the one with that stupid fucking American Soldier? Homecoming. Um, yeah, maybe that. One. I did play that, mm. and was just like. Yeah. Why is Pyramid Head here? <laughs> yeah. I'm one of those people, like the the purists. But no, I liked four. I thought four was really interesting, and I don't know. Yeah. I think it almost should have been not called Silent Hill. It should have just been called The Room. Um, and I think people would have liked it more because yeah. what a you know what a creative um thought. A guy that thinks a room is his mother, like that in itself, is amazing. Yeah. I think I think that was my favorite one. I, I mm. think. Um, what about PT? Did you play the? <laughs> I, I I literally couldn't play it. I I've I've watched <laughs> <laughs> I've watched it. I've watched it played through many 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 times. Very you know headphones on, immersed, big screen, lights off. But I can't I can't play it because I'll die. I'll have a heart attack and die. It is too much, isn't it? it is it's like, too much. I'm fine. I'm fine with a jump scare, but that is like reaching too into much. my soul. And yeah, just squeezing it and no. It, I almost think it's kind of a blessing that we didn't get Silent Hills like the full game because who I don't know who would have been able to handle it to be honest. It can't have all been like that though, can it? Surely. I don't know. We don't will know. never know. We will never we'll, know. We'll never know. No. Nope. Only Hideo Kojima will know. Mm-hmm. We'll have to. We'll have to ask him. We'll I'll ask him next time we hang out. Ask him next time we hang out, which is <laughs> next week. Um, <laughs> give him my love. Okay, that's all I've got for horror news. I guess we'll talk about what we've been watching as well. I mean, I've only got like a couple of things for this. I don't know if you've seen anything. It doesn't have to be the last seven days. 
Just anything recently that you've seen? Horror or horror, Jason? Pull up my letterbox. Um, so I mentioned Bones and All that I watched. Um, I recently watched... I've been trying to watch more horror from Thailand um, because okay, it's kind of a big okay. blind spot for me. I've only really seen um, Shutter, which is a great film, and La La Land, which I saw recently. But I, I recently watched a film called Coming Soon by... And I'm really going to butcher this director's name. I apologize. So fun. Sak da Pisid. Apologies to that director. Um, Which was a film about a... <laughs> it's basically like a moral tale of don't pirate films. It was kind of like The Ring where the okay. film is cursed and you go and see it in the movie theater and you get the curse um anyway it was very good but... so like a movie version of that you wouldn't steal a film yeah basically you wouldn't steal a policeman's album. yeah exactly um it wasn't it wasn't great i, I don't think i'd recommend it but i i'm glad i saw it because i am trying okay. to watch more thai horror um hmm. and then honestly i haven't seen because I because I was at Grimfest and then I haven't had the internet for ages, so I haven't seen that much. I did manage to catch a really interesting film at the Leeds International Film Festival, which is called um, The Fifth Thoracic Vertebra, which I wrote about in my newsletter actually, which is a Korean. Oh, wow. okay. It's a it's a Korean film. It's about a an aim. Now I'm going to describe this. It's going to sound a lot more horrifying than it actually is. It's about mm -hmm. a an alien parasitic fungus that lives inside a mattress and it steals people's spines and takes over their body but it's not it it's not how it sounds at all it's like okay. it's it was really lovely and it was really heartwarming it was more about a story mm. of like humanity and you know moving on and relationships breaking up and so on and so forth um but yeah that was really interesting and i urge anyone to check it out if you can i don't know if and when it's ever going to get released here but if you stumble across it then do have a watch yeah, I mean, that's that's not incredibly interesting. Mm -hmm. What's that? A parasitic fungus living in your mattress? Yeah, forget <laughs> all that. I love you. <laughs> you don't have that it? in your mattress? Mm. <laughs> you don't have that in your mattress. <laughs> uh, nice. Okay. Well, that sounds that sounds interesting. I don't know. Oh. I don't know if I've seen any Thai horror, you know, or or much at all. It's, there's some. I mean, like I I said, uh, Shutter is a really really good one. Uh, oh, and how could I forget? Um, The Medium, which came out last oh, okay. year, which is by a director called Banjong Pisantana Kun, um, and it's fucking terrifying. Um, so I definitely think you should watch that. Did Shutter get a, a, a um English language remake? Yes, it did. Oh, is the less we say about that? The better. I, I'm. I, that's my opinion with any Western oh, remake. Oh yeah, I remember that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've seen that though. Um, that's your opinion on any. Okay, is there a Western remake of an Asian horror film that you think is all right? No, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I guess the most obvious answer is The Ring, but even mm -hmm. like the Gore Verbinski one. But even that is not as good as people make it out to be like Naomi Watts is very good in it but um Samara or um Miss Sadako looks yeah. fucking awful like in like from where we are now when I first watched The Ring when it first came out in the 2000s obviously it was scared shitless but you look at it now and she just hmm. Miss Thing has aged poorly um Miss whereas Bing. the ring like the original ring the Japanese ring Samara yeah. in that still looks um uh, Sadako still looks scary because she's not like a CGI computer face. She was a real mm. actress. Um, I don't Did know. Did you if see any the 2020 version of The Grudge? That was, a, a, that, was a, that was an utter shit show. The Grudge, I'll, I'll the say... Grudge is one of my favorite films, so I can't. I can't. Yeah. Did you see? Did you watch the Juon um, series as well? I didn't. No, because <laughs> because the thing is, I always say Juon is my favorite franchise, and I hate ninety percent of it. Oh right, okay. Um, I thought it was good. The series. The series yeah, no, good. I actually have heard okay things about that, so I probably I probably will get around yeah. to it. Um, just put that on the list oh, yeah. with all the other that, things. That twenty twenty grudge film was was I I was literally looking around in the cinema like this can't be happening. <laughs> this can't be happening. What is happening? <laughs> This is awful. Yeah, um, I but I am I am a fan of of the ring, the Gorbachev whiskey, um, mm -hmm. Verbinski ring. Um, yeah, sorry, 
<laughs> don't apologize. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's a good uh, film. I just don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, just because I think it had its own sort of atmospheric, it felt like separate from from the original. Just yes, bit, and I'll like tell you different... what I do respect about that film is that it made people interested in Japanese horror. Um, yeah, and I think a lot of people, a lot of Japanese films, especially back in the day, were so hard to get hold of, um, mm. and especially translated or with subtitles. No way. So I think I, I do really like that uh, The Ring and, and subsequently the, the Grudge remake um, with Sarah Michelle Gellar. Was she in it? Yeah. She was. Um, she was. That one. Yeah. <laughs> that they kind time. of, um, you know, they bought, they bought it to the West and kind of a lot of people would not have been able to see, myself included, would not have, you know, grown to love Japanese horror without that. So I can't, I can't speak too much shit about them. Yeah. I don't know what you mean. Um. Okay. Anything else you've seen that you wanted to mention, or is that it? That's it. I think everything else I've seen was the um the old school stuff that we talked about that I saw at Grimfest, the classic. So yeah. Oh yeah. The only thing I've really got to mention this week um is the the menu which I went to see. Oh, um, I haven't seen that yet. It was kind of a toss up for me between the menu and Bones and all, and it was mm-hmm. only it was literally the decision was only made by which one was being shown. Um, closest to us mm-hmm. we went for the menu and this is really good i okay. really liked it i really enjoyed it it's got big a24 vibes mm-hmm. but i don't think it is an a24 film is it it's no, not it's no, no. Mm-hmm. big a24 fi- vibes to, to the point where i was like this soundtrack is the hereditary soundtrack it, but it cut- is one of the so- I, in the trailer they use one of the songs is actually it? yeah 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 they use the song when peter gets crowned at the end of hereditary That's it's exactly called reborn it by colin Re- stetson yes um, so yes it is. so you're not that. Really crazy that's right yeah i was like this is the hereditary music yeah oh, it, just, it just sounds a bit like it no, no it's, it the is. Fucking, it's the fucking hereditary music. <laughs> so it kind of it felt a little bit like okay, so it's borrowing from that in terms to try and make a moment like like at the end of hereditary at the end of the menu, which felt a little bit like that. Mm-hmm. Um, in a way, some of the stuff from watching the trailer for the menu, some of the stuff that I kind of expected to happen did happen, mm-hmm. and in that way, I was a bit like okay, it's kind of gone in the direction I kind of expected it to, but. Mm-hmm. It's just done really well. And Ray Fiennes has got like big Hannibal Lecter vibes, but not he's in the cool. way you would expect. I'm not okay. trying to say he's cooking anyone's brain, but um, and uh, Anya Taylor Joy is is amazing as well. Don't mm-hmm. usually like Nicholas Holt in anything, but you know he was fine, I mm-hmm. guess. Um, but yeah, I reckon I recommend this for like uh, I guess I guess it's got some horror vibes, but it's mainly sort of like single location thriller scenario. Definitely um, on my list. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was, I was pretty impressed by it. So I, I do recommend that. And bones and all, maybe tomorrow, maybe in a couple of days. I'm hopefully going to check it out. So it's, it's, it's good. It's good. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I don't have much more to say on it yet. I think I need to watch it again. Yeah, maybe another watch. Uh, mm-hmm. so looking forward to it now. Okay, so apart from that is the movie of the week, mm-hmm. uh, which is. Tetsuo the Iron Man, which which is a 1989 Japanese cyberpunk body horror film written, produced, edited, and directed by Shinya Tsukamoto. Mm-hmm. Correct? Um, I'm not very good with the pronunciations of anyone. No, that's right. Name, let alone my own. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, a businessman accidentally kills the metal fetishist who gets his revenge by slowly turning the man into a grotesque hybrid of flesh and rusty metal. Don't get yourself into that scenario. If you meet the metal <laughs> fetishist, don't accidentally kill him. Um, so it has got 6.9 on IMDb. Nice. 3.8 on Letterboxd. Uh, 82% critic score. 76% audience score. I've got some choice reviews from Letterboxd here. Um, I thought, <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so Josh Lewis says... A 16 millimeter frenzy of industrial body horror that is equal parts a razor head, clear inspiration for its uncompromising sound design of scratching slash screaming, and Videodrome, plenty of fleshy lo-fi technophobia FX. Um, five stars. Yeah, nice one, Josh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice one. Cobra Rocky says, possibly the closest cinema's ever come to capturing a migraine on film. Yeah, 100%. Four stars. 
<laughs> I, I, I really enjoyed this one. So usually I include four reviews. Uh, sorry, three reviews, but I had to include this one um, as well. Zara says, yo, imagine just walking down the street, minding your own business, and a giant fucking pile of scrap metal just zooms past you like Sonic <laughs> the fucking Hedgehog. <laughs> Why not? Four and a half stars. Um, and then finally, Logan Kenny says, like staring into the eyes of God and realizing that they're a mutated monster with a dick drill. Transcendent, horrifying, the most metal movie I can think of. I mean, quite literally. Four stars. Logan nice. Kenny. Mm-hmm. So usually I'm trying to do a nice cross section of of reviews. I think we captured most. Um, probably the one that I agree with the most is the migraine one. Yeah. Um, not not in a bad way, you know. I'm not saying that it just gave me a migraine and nothing more. I got a lot from this film, but yeah, I kept. I did think if I did have a headache, this would probably have to have to go off. So yeah, <laughs> it's a panic attack. Like the whole yeah. film is is one panic attack. <laughs> like. It feels wrong for me to say that it's a comfort film for me, but it kind of is, even though it makes me want to die. So, I mean, sometimes the the only comfort is feeling close to closer to God. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, so what? I mean, so what's your relationship with this film? When did you first see it? And um, I saw it at a very probably the worst time you could ever see it which was during and i feel like a lot of my horror history comes from this one time i in basically when i was in university i had a complete nervous breakdown like a lot of people do um and during that time to help me turn to like the the lowest horror like the darkest meanest horror that i could find and i remember something that i really loved at this time was eraserhead because you know of course why why be happy when you can watch a race <laughs> and i think i think i was like on on tumblr um and i think i put the call out and i was basically oh. like yo does anyone have any recommendations for films that i wanted to get as close to a raise ahead as possible and someone was like oh you're gonna watch tets or the iron man and i was like okay um and you know from there is history i fell in love with it pretty much instantly um because it was like it was like nothing i'd ever seen before obviously it's very much like a razorhead and videodrome and mm. a, a lot of other japanese cyberpunk films that came out at a similar time but i had not seen those yet um i'd not seen videodrome yet so ted Saw was completely new to me and i had seen quite a lot of j-horror at this point but it was mostly like mm. your rings your grudges mm. your one miss calls um so like supernatural yeah supernatural Ghosties. the yorkai like hair over the face i had never seen something like this and i had never seen something that used sound and stop motion and m- monochromatic monstrousness that is in this film and yeah i fell in love with it instantly and i have carried it with me throughout my horror journey and i just think it's wonderful yeah i mean it's it is definitely an experience both visually and aud- audibly i don't forget what mm. words mean there. Uh, <laughs> because it kind of reminded me of maybe like watching not not like a music video, but you know sometimes when I don't know you might buy a DVD, one of the Nine Inch Nails DVD, Tool DVD, and there'll be just some random visual, yeah, yeah, madness going yes. on like between songs or between mm-hmm. music videos. It kind of felt like that. It kind of felt mm-hmm. very experimental. It feels like obviously yes, there is a plot, but the plot is quite loose in terms of. I mean, yes, yeah, open to interpretation, um, and the visuals are yeah very very unnerving mm-hmm. very intense um obviously describing it as like a migraine but like a trip which is like a oh real, yeah mm-hmm. uh, it's not even like a bad trip it's kind of like you're just on the on the line and you could go either way you just you have know? to you just have to go with Tetsu. i feel like you know that the stop motion scenes of like racing through the streets that is how you have to go with this movie you just have to fucking hold on for dear life and hope that mm. you end up in the right place so unpredictable it does almost feel like a like a dream or a fever dream or a nightmare in a yeah. way. Well, it is mm-hmm. so unpredictable that you just don't know what's coming next. And mm-hmm. whatever does come next is always, is always a shock. <laughs> it's always a shock. Um, I mean, we are going to discuss the film at great length and we are going to discuss the film um, and plot wise. So I am going to just run through a fairly basic plot 
description but if you want to add anything you know something that maybe i've missed um i know we've sort of talked briefly as well about thematic ideas and kind of things that perhaps mm-hmm. aren't obvious to everyone who watches the film and maybe are more obvious to some than others or you know as it's open to interpretation you can have a relationship with this movie it seems that mm-hmm. it's, it talks to you um in terms of like something to do with you personally as well um so it'd be good to sort of jump into that too um so how does it begin you've got that metal f- <laughs> you've got the metal fetish i love how we just called the metal fetishist mm-hmm. like imagine just going going through your life and somehow you know no one calls you by your name anymore they just call you by <laughs> and that is something fetishist that is shinya sukamoto as well that is um the director for anyone who didn't know um so you know He's got a key part in this as Mr. Mr. Metal Fetishist. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to cast myself as the Metal Fetishist. <laughs> Why not? Just you <laughs> wait. Um, yeah. So we're introduced to the Metal Fetishist who's in his... It's difficult to say. <laughs> fetishist. Too, much, too many S's going on. Um, he's in his Tokyo hideout. Um, it's full of loads of bits of metal. <laughs> sorry i'm so sorry if i describe this movie at any point with the <laughs> most basic language possible um and, and he's got like photos surrounding him what well, is it like famous athletes it almost athletes, seems like yeah he's trying to make himself into the perfect organism sexy bodies the, yeah sexy bodies with the use of um metal with the mm-hmm. use of all these metal sort of apparatus and stuff like that. Um, he's got like a huge metal rod in his thigh. It's painful. Mm-hmm. It's incredibly painful. Um, and then he unwraps that wound a little bit later. Um, discovers it's rotting. It's covered in maggots. He's like, I've done something wrong here, you know. Mm-hmm. We've <laughs> all been there. Be... We've all been there. We've gone, how's this leg looking with the massive metal <laughs> rod in it? Ah, oh, maggots Not looking again. great. Yeah, it looks a bit painful. Um, so he runs outside into the street and he gets mown down um, and killed. That's right, isn't it? Well, killed. Mm-hmm. Is that... Have I got everything correct so far? Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I know it's kind of like... I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm describing what's happening. However, it's represented by just like um, so many like kinetic visuals, quick mm-hmm. cuts, um and loads and loads of different things that are open to interpretations. Like it, it feels like a bit of a scrapbook in a way, like a, a film scrapbook. Yeah, scrap metal. Kind of get... mm-hmm. Scrap metal, exactly. Yeah. Um, and the people, and he gets hit by a car by a salary man, is the only way he's described. Salary mm-hmm. man. What's that? You pay monthly? Salary. <laughs> uh, okay, that's nice. Uh, and a woman in brackets, girlfriend. Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> who um, i gotta shout out to the woman just very quickly so her name is Kei fujiwara she is um she is an actress on this film she's also she was also the cinematographer on this film um she is a director in her own right she did a horrible film called organ and one called ito um she also made the drill okay. phallus um and i just feel like Kei fujiwara doesn't get enough credit for being a woman involved in this psychotic project so i just want to shout out her very quickly because she's great psychotic project do you sit <laughs> down your cv as well just write, I, I try Psycho- to, psychotic yeah. psychotic project <laughs> um what did you do well i played the girlfriend and also i made the big metal dick. <laughs> i made the big metal dick did you see the big metal dick oh, i did yeah, it was good best one i've ever seen <laughs> um so yeah so after mowing down the metal fetishist the salary man starts to have visions Mm -hmm. um of just loads of various metal industrial machinery loads of stuff like that and it does look like he's just plugged his head into mtv in maybe 1993 (laughs) there's loads loads of stop motion (laughs) there's loads of stop motion Mm -hmm. um Grunge, grunge, and sort of industrial metal was was a big thing, and there was all this all this madness. Um, it does seem like he's just plugged his head into that because it's very intense. Very nine inch nails. It's very nine inch nails, yeah. Um, and that's the thing; it feels kind of like 
dirty and grimy in a way, mm. doesn't it? I mean, even though shot shot in black and white, you just it feels like one of those films. Oh, that's can... filthy. It's it's an absolutely disgusting film. It's completely, completely grimy. Completely grimy. Especially like the way everything that happens in the bathroom. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, get get the get the Sif out. Sif? <laughs> Is it Sif or Jif these days? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't used it for years. <laughs> I haven't used it for you. Uh, it looks like one of those. It's just come on, someone, mm-hmm. someone, can we clean this, clean this bathroom? Um, we can't. No, we're all transforming into horrible kind of. Because this is the thing. It's not like a. They're not turning into robots or artificial. There's no artificial intelligence involved, is there? No, no, no. It's 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 metal. It's a it's a metal virus. Um, mm. that's something I, I love about this film is that before I had never seen a film where something like metal worked as like a, a living microbiological being. Um, mm. You know, we get, we have so many films about viruses and spreading the infection, but I had never seen before the film where the infection was, was metal was chrome mm. and, you know, harsh pieces of glass and jagged edges coming out. Yeah. I mean, it's like also like the scope of what this, disease can do because obviously we we will we'll get into it towards the end but we kind of understood it's understood that they're going to take over the world with Mm -hmm. this metal disease and like it it feels like very personal to start with like just somebody's you know arm or leg or something turn into metal but in the end it's like eventually your brain will turn to metal and it's like then we're just going to take over the world Mm -hmm. and it's that when you understand the scope of it like that it is kind of scary yeah um it's like a dizzying how can you describe it i'm just i'm just trying to read here just something that kind of describes it better than i'm trying to it's like got a lot, so it's got like a lot of like handheld photography it feels very like in your face as i already mentioned like kinetic dizzying just intense it feels it feels like a sort of tornado of yeah i mean i i also it was it was notoriously very hard production wise and by the end of it the only people left were Tsukamoto and um oh, wow. Tomowaro Toguchi who plays the salary man everyone else fucked off because it, it I, I feel like this film looks as hard and as awkward and as difficult and uncomfortable that's the right word as it was mm. to film I think the production was really hard you know long long days no money skeleton crew all practical, all being, you know, after a while, being plugged in and like having metal glued to your face, you would start feeling absolutely insane and you would be like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Um, so I think the production of this film kind of plays into how it how it feels to watch it. It's just an agonizingly uncomfortable film. There's not a moment in this film where you're like, oh, this is nice. I could stay here. Everything is like, no, 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 fucking stop, stop, stop screaming and yelling and pain and anger and great stuff. Yeah. Um, why did everybody fuck off then? You just had enough. Had a guts well, I think, I think Shinya Sukamoto was, I don't know if he remains, but not, not the easiest person to mm. work with. Um, this was kind of a passion project of his, I think. I'm not sure if it was his first film. It was definitely an early film. Um, and, you know, starting out as a filmmaker, he was very much of, you know, he was given his little 16 millimeter camera as a youth and was a big Lynch fan, obviously, and really mm. wanted to make something bare bones and as horrible and as Eraserhead. And I, I mean, I can't remember the story of Eraserhead either, but I feel like Lynch didn't have a lot of money on that production either. And so that kind of informed the way that Eraserhead looks. But yeah, I think the iron man was long days everyone had you know no money to their name which you can you can tell because this film has a very low budget um and i think you know after a while another thing is that you know japan's labor conditions and working conditions which is actually a very big point in the movie which i will get into is that having lived in japan for a long time is um they work very hard and it's not always fun in fact it's very rarely fun to work like you know 30 hour days or whatever so it's probably a lot to do with that as well just checking here it does look like it was the directors i think he'd made a few things before that i'm going to read out some of the names for them because some of them are great 
Second, the first second project he ever made was Story of a Giant Cockroach in 1975. <laughs> so a lot of this stuff is like on Super 8 and 16 millimeter cameras. Mm-hmm. Um, he moved on to 35 millimeter um, after Tetsuo, mm-hmm. and then went back to 16 millimeter looks. He did also make something called the Phantom of regular size. Fair enough. Yeah. He made What's a film that? called uh, Hiroko Hiro, Hiroko the Goblin, which is a yeah great movie as well. Okay, Look at that. um, Look if I've ever seen that, yeah. Uh, and just before Tetsuo the Iron Man, he made The Adventures of Electric Rod Boy. Yeah, well, what can you say? So clearly, he's got like a got like a niche that he aims for. Mm-hmm. Phantom of regular size, though. I wonder if he started off making the fan the massive Phantom. He <laughs> didn't have the budget for it. And then he went, <laughs> Do you reckon we could change the title of this? Go on. What should we change it to? <laughs> should we just call it The Phantom? Just a regular nah. man, really. We'll call, can we call it The Phantom of regular size? <laughs> sounds a bit silly. Sounds a bit like you've had a big Phantom and now you've reduced into a regular size. No. <laughs> sounds fine. It'll be fine. It sounds absolutely just fine. Just get it out there. <laughs> <laughs> just get it out there. Phantom of, the, Phantom of regular size. Uh, but yeah, it does seem like a very... Yeah, uncom- I did think that a lot in this. I thought, imagine being in that makeup. There's a couple of moments when... People are kind of sat in bath water mm-hmm. as well. And I did kind of think, that looks cold. Mm-hmm. That looks ice cold. And, and met- you know, metal is, it's all very clearly very real metal. You know, I don't know how mm-hmm. much a budget they had for making like gentle silicon pieces. Um, but, you mm-hmm. know, metal is notoriously very, very uncomfortable and sharp and cold. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I would be pissed off too. <laughs> what you're saying is, if you're in this film and you were all metalled up, you'd be pissed off as well. Oh yeah, especially if I wasn't getting paid for it. So nobody got paid. I think that. Well, I don't know. I don't, not a lot. No. Hmm. Maybe they got to take some of the metal home. You know, Maybe you <laughs> melt it down, sell it. Take to... as much scrap as you want. Take take as much scrap. Take as much scrap as you like. Well, it's all over me, so I'm gonna. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, the effects look really good. Some. So, I mean, some close ups. It looks a bit tinfoily or kind of mm-hmm. like but i think for the most part the effects are really good and that stop motion of when everything's kind of latching on and taking root and body parts are transforming and stuff it is really effective um yeah so oh yeah so before i was about to jump into the train scene but before that i think the salary man after getting tortured by his visions He's having a shave, and he notices a big metal spike sticking out of his face. Well, it's not that big, but you know, it's quite small. Protruding from his cheek, he spurts blood when he touches it. Um, has a little, has a chat to his girlfriend, and then on his way to work, <laughs> I mean, this was pretty nuts. So he's on the, he goes to the train platform, sits next to a, a to a woman, and I'm trying to work out what happened here. Did, was she like? Did she kind of look at something on the ground, and then it affected her? Yeah, there's like a there's like a ma- a mash of flesh and metal um yeah. on the ground in the subway and her curiosity kind of um kills the cat really because mm. then she's infected yeah so are we supposed to believe that this infection is kind of just like dotted around the city possibly just taking over people or is it because the salary man is nearby that it's decided to well my so my my enduring reading of this film and if I if I may go off on a tangent, um, is that this this film is about working yourself to death. Um, so I'm gonna get my history head on a bit here. Mm. <laughs> so obviously, Japan coming out of World War Two, <clears throat> um, and I am absolutely no expert in Jap- Japanese history. And uh, please, listeners, feel free to tell me that I'm fucking wrong because I probably am. <laughs> But after World War II, you know, Japan come out a country completely devastated, massive amounts of debt, reparations that they have to pay. Um, they've been bombed into absolute oblivion. We've got to repair everything. So that they worked hard, 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 hard work for years. And, you know, up until the 80s, we get this massive economic boom um, in Japan. We get this revival of steel and construction industries between uh, like 87 and 89 um, obviously technology like electronics the demand for that overseas and in Japan um, became very famous especially in America in the 80s everyone you know wanted a piece of Japanese technology um, but with economic prowess comes 
hard work and it's so in japan they they actually have a word for it it's called i think it's karoshi which means death from overwork um and it's been mm. highly documented in japan that people have literally worked themselves into the grave um in 1988 i wrote i hear the labor force reported that um a quarter of all male working employees in japan were working 60 hour weeks um so <laughs> <Jesus> <laughs> So when I when oh. I watch when I watch um Ted so I I take all that you know this was this film was came out in 1989 but will have been you know Sukamoto will have been growing up in that time he will have been seeing his family work very very hard he lived in Tokyo so you know right in the center he probably had a white collar job a salary man job um and uh where were we the the flesh on the ground to me they're going to work um he's he's going to the subway the woman next to him is obviously going to work as well so the act of going to work um is when this consumption this metal virus takes you over because where we end up in tetsuo is this is technology and work and metal consuming you and you forget everything that makes you a human being you know sex food skin all becomes hard and metallic because overworking yourself makes you literally a machine um so that's what i think the thing on the ground <laughs> is for <laughs> yeah i mean it's 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 um it makes a lot of sense i think now i hear it like that um has the director confirmed like some of some of this i actually this, haven't i haven't read that um a lot of interviews with sakamoto i okay. i don't i don't know um I wouldn't think it's a stretch to assume that he no, comes from this like so. this um this group of filmmakers like him and and Takashi Miike and uh Takashi Shimizu who who were all growing up in that time and who have all been quite obvious with their anti anti capitalist anti working yourself to death culture in their films. So I don't I don't I think he'd probably agree with me. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully no, I mean, that, that sounds it sounds spot on to me like um a lot of the visuals kind of obviously i, I didn't particularly have something in in mind for how it what it was thematically i think with a lot of movies about something taking over your body it's usually related to some sort of especially you know especially in the 80s it, a lot of this stuff probably would have usually been related to some sort of std some sort of oh definitely trans yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing. Mm -hmm. obviously a lot of things were kind of like these these um, metaphors for AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, so for something like this, I didn't get that vibe at all. So I, with you with you describing it like that, that makes a, a lot more sense mm -hmm. um, for me. And it's a really interesting sort of like unique take on that as well. I th um, you're definitely right though about um, the HIV and AIDS parallels. I mean, in the eighties, pretty much anything that was about a virus that takes mm -hmm. you over was um about aids but in in japan in the 80s they had a lot of issues with um uh like contaminated blood um and a lot of hemophiliacs unfortunately ended up infected with hiv and aids because of um a mess up with some contaminated blood that ended up in you know blood donors so i think oh, wow. in about 80 88 or 89 i think a, there was a lawsuit around that so you know that would have been playing into this film mm. and um i'm not saying it's about hiv and aids it's not explicitly but that's there you can take that mm. reading of it um because you can also take a th there's so much sex in this film it's it's a film about um subversive sex and it's a very queer film as well it's a very homoerotic film um i know a lot of trans mm. people love this film and take a lot from this film which you can absolutely see this like transhumanism and this changing of the body into something bigger and better than what it can be um so mm. there's definitely sex and um identity and gender all in this film as well so it's got it's got everything yeah i mean there's a hell of a lot going on and yeah as you as you mentioned it just seems like the audience <laughs> they can take their own they can make their own decision about what these things mean and how they sort of relate to that in terms mm -hmm. of you know um 
as you mentioned, like gender identity. I was definitely sort of getting those vibes in there as well. And yeah, there's a lot of homoerotic stuff going on. The metal fetishist and the salary man. Yeah, uh, well, it's about but... two men with a fetish who come together <laughs> at the, at the, the against all odds. They find each other basically and unite. What you do, no it's what a love into, story. <laughs> no matter what you're into. There's always exactly. someone else who's into it, you know? Or the, you they, say... He literally says at the end that our love can destroy this fucking world. Like, Tetsuo is a love story. <laughs> it's a romance. It's more romantic than that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I was kind of, I was kind of getting those those vibes as well and uh there's a lot of there's there's a there's a pegging sequence as well i mean not straight up pegging but you know um pretty much and because <laughs> kind of that also made me kind of think about um gender roles in the 80s in this particular mm. in this particular country as well i mean I'll, again i don't know if there's anything about that 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 you sort of had oh, definitely i think on. i think um Again, no expert. I want to put this disclaimer out there? I'm not Japanese. I, I have lived in Japan, but I'm no expert. But there's the the gender thing. I think Jap- Japan is and has always has been a very patriarchal country, um, where men have have been traditionally the workers, and the women have stayed at home, and the women have been expected to you know do this and be housewives and be very meek and submissive. So I think the fact that this film has a woman pegging, raping. Um, the salary man it's about this fear it's not about but you know it could be read as like this fear mm. of this fear of sex this fear of um of women becoming empowered <laughs> and becoming sexually aggressive because what's more terrifying than that um but no it, and it, it's it's you know it's also about fear of fear of being gay it's about fear of enjoying um anal sex or you know fear of subversive sex I think a lot of it has to do with um subverting a lot of the gender roles that were in Japan especially in the 80s and still to an extent to this day although Japan has come a long way with their Mm. feminism it's still you know a woman topping a man still (laughs) wouldn't have been like you know top of the agenda shall we say sodomizing him yes I mean it's a very there's a lot of phallic imagery, yes, but the the, the girlfriend kind of like dances erotically, you would say. Um, and then this is the thing: she does penetrate the salary man, um, mm-hmm. and he doesn't see it doesn't seem to be something that he is enjoying. So maybe it is kind of like that taking ownership of that particular thing, and especially in like eighties Japan as well. I don't know, conservative eighties Japan. Sort of was in terms of well, sex Japan, yeah japan is it has it, japan and sex are odd because on the one hand yes they are very conservative but on the other hand things you know tens of cool porn exist and and hentai is is very big and having lived there uh, you know you can walk into a corner shop and there is a fucking like lolita hentai manga at eye level with children very explicit stuff out in public for all to see so they they do culturally traditionally have quite a, a quite an unusual attitude to sex so we we would call it unusual in the west um mm. but yeah I, I i still would think that the k fujiwara's character being sexually sub sub you know aggressive and dominant is 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 a fear thing i don't think he's into it he's you know he's scared of it and he's scared of this power that women have but he's also scared of being treated like a woman um Hmm. which you know is a universal thing for a lot of men i think yeah i mean yeah and that's that's the thing i'm sure this would affected a lot of people in a lot of different ways you know some people might look at it and think um Oh, I'm glad that's not me. <laughs> Whereas other people might, you know, it, it's going to affect people in different ways. And I think that's what's interesting about this film is that you can take so much away from it and look at all these, all, all the thematic stuff and make up your own mind of what mm. it kind of represents. Um, and it is just, an, it's a difficult, a difficult watch. And, you know, and as I mentioned already about the unnerving nature of it, it is, I mean, a phallic hose waving around before, <laughs> before going straight up your ass is pretty terrifying you know it's terrifying in, 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 yeah. any, in any way yeah definitely um, in what looks like a sort of cold like wet shower room bathroom yeah it's well. it's a horrible scene and i think i think a lot of people 
forget not forget though i think a lot of people don't realize that this this film has you know quite an explicit rape scene in it um mm. whether it happens or not is debatable because you know it could it could all be a dream but yeah it's, it's an intense film it's a hard watch yeah. definitely because there's because like um female on male rape is still got this sort of connotation surrounding it even today you know that that where it's not taken in the same well oh yeah or it's funny like i always yeah, see i always see it or, either or... presented as like it's not serious or it's a joke um which is you know it's very much just as serious as any gender hmm. being abused like that so I think I think it I think to put it in Tetsuo, you know, and then later the salary man tries to rape his girlfriend. So mm. it's it's gonna sound like gender equality, but um it's you know, it, it's it's both sides. It's um it's an aggressive film. Everyone yeah. is sexually aggressive, everyone but is fearing each other's sexuality. Both sides are represented and obviously te- like obviously a terrible thing, but I don't think like female and male rape is, is portrayed in cinema very often. Obviously, I know we're talking about exploitation movies and talking about rape revenge movies. Um, when we talk, especially with Last House on the Left and last mm. week, is it is kind of portrayed in a certain way in horror. Mm-hmm. That, um, but I think the 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 reversal, the gender reversal like this, isn't shown very often. I mean, I can't think. I mean, I'm sure there are examples of it in in genre filmmaking, but I can't think of another example right now. It's um, not hugely common, no. No, so it seems like one of those things that that it's it's not it's not played for shock value, I wouldn't say, but it's played to like really really show all of these sort of sides of, yeah. of something like that. And it it is cultural as well. I mean, this this salary man in eighties Japan, conservative salary man, he would fear, he would be scared of a woman taking control. Like that, that would be a, a, a cultural anxiety of his um, and possibly a fetish at the same time. Yeah. And is that why, going back to this, we went off on a hell of a lot of different tangents there, but going back to the woman on the on the train platform, that's why he runs from her, right? Well, again, it's, uh, yeah, again, it, it's, it's, so a lot of people read this film as in that the salary man is gay. He and he's he's frightened of women. He's frightened of women's sexuality. He's frightened of having sex with women, which I think is a is completely valid reading of it. And I actually do read it a lot of that. But he also he could not be gay. He could be straight. Um, he could be bisexual. He could be anything. Whatever he is, he's scared of women. <laughs> he does not want these women. And all the women in this film, well, there's only two of them, but they are very aggressive. They, you know, they they're coming for him. They they want him or whatever <laughs> whatever they want from him. Um, yeah. And that's scary for this for this man. Um, so I think I think this film taps into a lot of cultural anxieties of the eighties. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't have Japan's feminism like timeline in my head, but I would say certainly around the time of the eighties, things were starting to, you know, women were starting to be like hang on this can't be all there is hang on a minute hang on a minute um so yeah I do- out. yeah <laughs> we could do better than this ladies um but yeah no <laughs> i would say i would certainly say that's something that is you know plays throughout the film yeah um so i mean this is pretty int- what i also noticed about this it doesn't seem like anybody else is kind of aware of what's happening when she well that's of that's a japanese and- thing like well it's it's yeah. not i i don't i don't that's horribly generalizing but from from my experience living in japan and what i know about japan is that some that there is a, a certain tendency to look away and mm. not not get involved and not want to you know if there's a if there's a, a commotion mm. happening or a kerfluffle or a drama people will walk past and they will mm. not get involved um and I, I'm, you know, that happens in a lot of countries. It's not by any means, not just Japan, but it is, hmm. I have seen it quite a lot in Japan. Um, so that would, honestly, that's kind of natural that no one, no one looks is at woman, it. Has that woman got a metal arm and she trace, chasing just, that man uh, down for some just reason? Just keep going, just keep just going. Away. <laughs> I'd just look away if I was you. What are you looking for? None of your business. Um, so she chases him into like a toilet store, doesn't she? Mm. I think he thinks he got away with it by going to the toilet store and shutting the door. Which sometimes mm. makes people go away, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Private time now, mm-hmm. but uh, now she tries to get in through the top of the toilet stall. Um, 
how does he defeat her? I can't remember. He just like knocks her down the knee. Yeah, yeah, I think he just runs over her. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't remember this, the actual scene. The thing is, so so many scenes happen in such quick succession throughout this film. Oh yeah, that to and pinpoint any with like so many. Yeah, to pinpoint other any individual scene is quite hard. So I I yeah. kind of usually think of it as a more nebulous thing rather than like. That's a, great, that's a great way of thinking of it. I think that's a great way of thinking of it. Um, because I think chronologically, after that, he, the flesh on his arm is like slowly turning into mm-hmm. metal, and I think it's then where he's. I'm, I'm assuming this is a dream sequence, or so it seems to say here, is that the whole sodomizing phallic pose stuff that we just. Yeah, I read it. I detail. read it as a dream, and I think the. I think you know Sukamoto being a Lynch fan is. Yeah. We can say it's, but oh, it's one yeah. of those Lynch dreams where it's a dream, but it's it's not detached from reality. It's you know the, the dream yeah. and reality are one. It's not expressively um, sort of bookended with somebody falling asleep, and no, having the dream and then yeah. jolt, jolting awake. It's not yeah. kind of like, and the dream like is that. just as important as the reality. Mm. Um, so when he seems to wake up, I think the metal transformation is accelerating. Um, and that is when him and his girlfriend have sex, have consensual mm-hmm. sex. This is nothing to do with the the phallic host sodomizing dream sequence. Um, and after that is they have a lovely bit of dinner. And, and this is like <laughs> this. I think this was the most intense, like difficult to watch. Like if you don't like watching people eating, it was just the audio as well. Was just like this mm-hmm. it kind of felt like nails on a chalkboard sort of stuff, metallic screeching sounds. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, and this scene comes to an interesting conclusion when the salary man's penis is transformed into a large metal, a large metal drill. Yeah, large... wow. <laughs> there we go. I mean, what could <laughs> represent um, a penis more than, <laughs> than that, right? Um, it looks pretty. It looks pretty large. I don't know if it. I mean, it looks like an industrial type of drill. And can, it, he's you yeah. get it being Q. No, definitely, and I think he, you know, it's the the f- he's terrified. He's absolutely terrified. Because, well, I mean, why wouldn't you be, to be honest? But it's this first real step into transhumanism where he's like, "Oh fuck, that's that bit's gone. I'm fully gone. Like, there's no coming back from this." Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, he doesn't seem best pleased, and it, he obviously attacks attacks his girlfriend, um, and she ends up clobbering him over the head with mm-hmm. a frying pan uh which is always a good weapon to use I mm-hmm. think, if you've got one um uh but he kind of like gives gives himself an extra life i guess by by electrocuting himself by sticking is it just a fork or like a yeah. knife and fork into it's, an electrical socket? yeah just a fork um and you know i think at this point we're meant to see that he's com- pretty much gone beyond human um, and now that you know the metal is in him, he, he like you say, he shocked himself into a second life. Um, yeah. But yeah, now he's he's back to it. He's loving it. So this life is perhaps not anything like the life he he lived before. This is kind of like his new. It's hard to pinpoint metal. at what moment he fully he fully descends, um, because you know from the very start, is it when he hits? the fetishist in the car is it when the first Mm. bit comes out of his cheek is it when you know he he meets the woman in the subway but i think it's it's a gradual transformation into what he becomes in the end it feels like a gradual thing and it feels like it's represented at a good pace i guess Mm -hmm. um so yeah when he comes back to life that is when his girlfriend stabs him in the neck with a kitchen knife Mm -hmm. um and maybe I got a bit confused by what happened here, but did she just think that he was because he was dead? She was like, oh, "I can't go on." <laughs> was it like what a is, Romeo, I, I, Romeo I, Juliet I, scenario? Yeah, I think maybe you know she was like, "I can't live without this this drill penis man in my life." <laughs> I can't live without him. Oh, tell me about him. Tell me about him. He sounds lovely. Yeah, he's got a great sense of humor. Okay, he's really kind, caring, considerate, great fashion sense, and his dick is a drill. Oh, get <laughs> out! He sounds he sounds dreamy. <laughs> He sounds absolutely dreamy. <laughs> but of all the ways that she could kill herself, she impels herself on the dick drill. I mean, I I don't know if that's like a reference to like Harikiri, like 
opening the stomach i i personally don't know if it means that much i think it just looks cool um okay yeah. <laughs> um, we have to remember that sometimes all of these things don't have to have subtext we they do but i be... i'm i'm the worst for that i look for the subtext in most everything but sometimes even i hit a wall and i'm like it just yeah. looks good <laughs> dick drill i mean i could I kind of get it, you know, the especially well, that you're... I think the dick drill is very, you know, that's a that's a male weapon. That's a you know, and it, it, yeah. it tries to rape her. So I think that kind of, you know, that kind of speaks for itself. Um why she wants to die from it, I don't know. Everyone in this film has a fetish for something, maybe that's hers. She wants to die from it. Maybe it's like uh Yeah. Well, I mean, this film is really heavily rooted in like BDSM and kink as well, so hmm. like Okay. Well, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, you got the metal. Well, that's the thing. The fact that the metal dude is called the metal fetishist, it mm-hmm. goes to show that like the sex is very prevalent and, mm-hmm. and in this film. And uh, it's it's very much. I mean, it reminds me a lot of Crash, like Cronenberg's Crash, in that oh, yeah, um, the you know the ultimate high will be mm. to to die in a car crash. You know, you keep chasing that high um, until you end up dead. I haven't seen that in a long time. Is that like having sex and then having a car crash? Well, yeah, in, in, in Crash, they, they are aroused by oh, yeah, that's car like, crashes. Having your, your leg off. Yeah. Car crash victims and stuff, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry, I couldn't remember. <laughs> I hate to be that guy, but when Great anyone film. ever when anyone ever says crash and I go, oh, yeah, the the, the um, car crash sex film, and people go, no. No. The lovely <laughs> yeah, yeah. movie that somehow won Best Picture at the Oscars, know, where where know. there's all these all these all these relationships happening. I'm like, what? That's not it. It's <laughs> like people people get horny when they have car crashes, isn't it? No. Oh. Well, apparently it is. Um, <laughs> James Spader as well. Mm-hmm. I have to go film. rewatch that. I have to go rewatch that because it has been a long time since mm-hmm. I've seen that. Um. Okay. So where are we at? So killed herself by impaling herself on, on the drill but then the salary man awakens um and he realized what's happened he's obviously devastated and elsewhere the fetishist is laughing like a maniac how is he still alive well is i don't i don't i don't metal? yeah i i think you know it's i i don't think he's alive or dead in a sense i think he's transcended okay you know beyond humanity at this point um, so I don't yeah. think him dying was him dying in a traditional sense. Sure. Or almost like um, when the salary man becomes infected, that the personality of the fetishist kind of exists in tandem with yeah. the with the um, the the disease, essentially. Mm-hmm. And that has kind of infected him in his mind yeah, in a way that mm-hmm. maybe it's not even really physically mm-hmm. there. So yeah, then we get a flashback, which is like the doctor talking to a younger version of the fetishist, and was, it kind of represents how he came to be who he is. He's got mm-hmm. a piece of metal on his head. Um, doctor's like, can't believe you're still alive. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's actually impossible for me to move it. Rude, really... <laughs> doesn't he say? Just think of it as yeah, like a lovely think bit of, of it jewelry. as a piece of jewelry, and live your life, and continue to be normal. I just been like, are you are you a qualified doctor? Because I have got I've got I've I come through with a railing stuck through my neck. Just think of it as a, a bit of jewelry. A necklace, Mr. T. Just think of it. <laughs> um yeah, which is kind of nuts. Uh and I think the salary man's transformation into the Iron Man around about this point completes. He's mm-hmm. yeah, he's just a big old mess of Metal. He's gone. Yeah, he's completely transformed. He has, you know, th- I think there's still humanity left in him, but he's gone. <laughs> yeah, he's the man gone. we At least knew and loved. The man we knew and loved, the salary man. I had such great memories of him. The salary <laughs> man. He was a great guy. He, he is. doesn't exist. He doesn't exist anymore. He is just. Um, he's a transformer. He's Optimus Prime. Um, <laughs> so yeah, he, he receives a phone call from the fetishist. And he goes, I'm coming for you. Mm-hmm. I'd be like, what do you want from me? I'm, I am, I've turned into, you know, what you were going to become. Exactly. What do you want from me? I think he he wants to be with him. I mean, that's how I, 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 I mean, I know the ending is very much a, a cat and mouse chase, but I, I think they're in love. 
wants to be with him kind of like we are one and the same well exactly like... but i mean the metal fascist's goal at the at the end of the day is is a metal japan a metal world so it you know it makes mm. sense that he wants to amalgamate with as many as possible um bringing yeah. them all in together uniting them into one giant metal penis man I mean, if you asked him to explain it, so what, what? What's your end goal here? Basically, I want all of us to become a metal penis and just uh, take over the world. You go. Why not? Why not? I've got nothing else on. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not busy. Uh, so yeah, and, and I think it's then revealed that the salary man and his girlfriend are the ones that struck the fetishes with the car. Yeah, that was kind mm-hmm. of obvious from from the get go, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Then we see them disposing the bo- of the body in the woods. And then I'm having up sex up against a nearby tree. So, in a way, they are kind of because I feel like if you killed someone and then disposed of the body, that's probably the least horny I'd ever be. I again, I think it's that kind of crash thing where I think they do have this fetish for for this. Obviously, they're obviously not a normal couple. I mean, at the beginning of the film, they spend five minutes saying hello to each other on the phone and nothing else, just saying moshi moshi, oh, yeah. moshi oh, moshi, yeah, moshi moshi to can each just, other can you just text me this please? yeah <laughs> so they're obviously not a normal couple um so you yeah. know i i don't i they like that they you know they they get off on it and again that's yeah. a massively cronenberg thing yeah but that's it yeah it's like it's like lynch cronenberg it's all kind of um it's all here um and then the fetishist makes his way to the iron man's apartment i think that the, the Whenever any character moves from point A to point B in this film, they go at like the speed of light. But it's mm-hmm. almost like it is like stop motion, isn't it? Because their yeah. legs aren't actually moving; they're kind of just like yeah. I mean, I, it, it, it was filmed term. like gong gong gong, picture 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 picture, and put together. Um, but the effect is is a migraine. It's a, it's a panic attack. It is a migraine. It is. It kind of does remind me about how you kind of travel from A to B in a mm-hmm. dream or in a nightmare. Yeah. Like, or when you're being pursued by someone or something. And it's also like, like it, it, there's no, there's no, going back to what I was talking about, about how, you know, work is, work is God and work is king. There's no enjoyment to this movement. It's just, I've got to get, to, I've got to get to here. I've got to get mm. to here. And, you know, I, you see that a lot when people are walking to work and they're like desperately, you know, just focused on getting to work with a briefcase and, white shirt and whatever so it it reminds me of that in a way you know there's no stopping to enjoy the nature or the trees it's just go yeah do the job do the job get me to work i've got to mm-hmm. turn into a big metal dick get me there <laughs> right immediately um the fetishist makes his way to the iron man's apartment he, this i mean the same sort of effect but now like every piece of metal on the journey is kind of just getting crumpled into and again I guess it's a similar sort of thing with the stop motion effects, bikes and signs and everything just getting crumpled as, as it goes past. That's a good effect. Mm-hmm. Um, when he gets to the apartment, he turns his cat, turns the salary man's cats into metal, mm-hmm. um, which is nice of him. And he possesses the body of the dead girlfriend and then comes to attack the Iron Man essentially in his true form. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we're given like a there's like a fight sequence, which is pretty again, okay, yeah, pretty intense. And then the fetishist shows the Iron Man a post-apocalyptic vision of the new world where Earth is consumed by metal. Um, looks horrible, you know. Yeah, I know. You know, I think I think especially with a piece of Japanese media coming as close as they did to the literal end of the world with the, the two nuclear bombs that went off. I think like um, I'm always mm-hmm. interested to see uh, and going back very quickly to Silent Hill F, I've I've heard a lot of theories that Silent Hill F is about um, the bomb that, oh, went, okay. that went off in Hiroshima. Um, so I, I always think of that when I see this part, I'm like, well, this is very, this seems to be like a kind of very despondent and despairful and, tech-filled vision of a future um mm. which you know japan did horrific come horrifically close to yeah yeah and uh so what happens oh yeah so the, the, they continue fighting basically across the city now don't they just uh mm. making a right <laughs> uh, dread, dread to think how, much, how many millions of pounds worth of damage they've caused across it's the Japan, city. they'll clean it's it up the next day. <laughs> they work so fast there. Honestly, like we would come across, there would be like a sinkhole in the road or something. It'd be it'd be fixed the next day. Like it's amazing how quickly 
they work on infrastructure okay. over there. That could be as many metal fetishists versus Iron It'd Man fights fine. as you like. It would be absolutely across the fine. city. <laughs> It'll be cleaned up by tomorrow. <laughs> um, and then that basically the fetishist has um, a vision from his childhood where he is repeating. Is it the fetishist who has the vision? It is, isn't it? Yes. Where mm. there's like a guy. Uh, sorry, not just a guy. It's his, is it a guy or is it his dad? I couldn't. I wouldn't return it. Possibly his <laughs> dad, father figure. I, I, I think Some a lot bloke. of it is to do with like, yeah, it's it's cycles, you know, it's cycles of abuse and. Cycles of grief, yeah. cycles mm-hmm. of abuse, cycles of trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, beaten by this guy with a metal rod, it becomes embedded in his head. But this is the thing. This could just be a representation of that trauma. The actual exactly. metal getting embedded in his head could just be a representation mm-hmm. of that trauma. And then as with cycles of trauma, you're passing them on to somebody mm-hmm. else, um, whether it's a family member, a loved one, or anyone else like that. This could just be a representation of that. Um, I'm just spitballing here. Well, yeah, it's... I mean, it could be It could be, it could be the nothing that's ever happened and that it's the metal fetishist's pain and anger is so great that he wants to inflict it on everyone maybe the metal is the metal is a metaphor um Mm. which it obviously is but what if it's a metaphor for his the pain and anguish that he experienced as a child that it has become so great that it literally spreads out and affects infects everyone around it and everyone who comes into contact with it yeah i agree would you call it a metal for Bye. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the end of the podcast. Um, it's been great having you here. And I'm glad. Um, if you never want to come back on the show, it's absolutely fine. Um, I've been basically been waiting to do that the whole time we've been recording. Can you? That so should be you. the title Metal Four. <laughs> yes, it should. <laughs> and then I'll get a screenshot of you rolling your eyes <laughs> in that exact moment. Oh. It's a Metal Four. Okay. Um, and the results of this kind of big fight, they end up turning into a big single phallic mass of of metal um and that is when they vow to turn so you've got like the fetishist is like the sort of central point of this and the salary man is kind of like sort of like passed out He's, kind yeah of, like... I, I mean it's it's hard to describe because because he is looking in a terrible state but then he's like ah oh, i feel great um so <laughs> jury's out on whether he's actually enjoying it again maybe it's a bdsm thing where he's in a huge amount of pain but he is enjoying being part of this man fused together forever i kind of i kind of think it's a happy ending i i leave this film stressed out but i don't leave this film (laughs) depressed (laughs) stressed not depressed yeah exactly i mean it's not like i don't know like something like speak no evil which um i oh, yeah. wanted oh, to God. absolutely end everything yeah. afterwards but this one i end i feel like i'm like that was fucking horrible let's do it again someday let's do it again i, I walk you walk out and watching that movie i feel like a big metal dick um, yeah everything just... hurts my eyes hurt my throat hurts my <laughs> ears hurt but i'm not depressed so you know that's a win in my book. In a way, that's the least you can ask for. <laughs> exactly. Um, that is that is that for Tetsuo the Iron Man. So what we got to do is rate the movie. Mm-hmm. We do like a standard A to F um, school card rating. So as it's one of your favourites, I kind of feel like I know where you're going to go with this. But if you just tell me what your rating is, I'm just even though we've covered mostly everything, I I, I, it's an reason. it's an A from me. It's a, it's a five out of five. It's it's like nothing I've ever seen. We Every do A time... pluses. We do A pluses. Oh, it's A plus then. A plus. Okay, it, okay. It's like nothing I've ever seen. I know it's not for everyone. It's very important to me. Um, for for various reasons. Um, a lot of the stuff about the body and feeling alien in the body and mutating the body and hurting the body to an extent as well. As someone who has who suffers with body dysmorphia, I feel it it, re- it resonates with me personally a lot. So maybe I'm biased so i'm definitely biased towards it um mm. but i just think i just think it's it's not many things exist like this movie it feels like a very special very important piece of japanese not just japanese cinema of just cinema genre cinema in general um and i think not everyone will enjoy this film and i don't think i would recommend it to everyone um but for me solid solid well an A plus is some something more than solid, I would say. Uh, yeah, there we go. 
I it's difficult for me to rate this right because of course it's the first time I've seen it and as often happens with films that I see for the first time chatting about them at great length kind of mm-hmm. makes me appreciate them a lot more especially mm-hmm. with someone who especially with someone who loves the film mm-hmm. it kind of makes me think okay I can understand why and all, I'm talking about all the subtext and all the thematic ideas of it kind of makes me want to see it again and I did watch um Body Hammer Tetsuo mm-hmm. 2 which is very very different it's kind of a more i guess you'd say conventional film in a way yeah um, yeah i mean you can follow you can follow what's happening you can follow it in terms of a plot there's like a clear antagonist a yeah. clear protagonist mm-hmm. there's a clear like redemption arc i guess mm-hmm. in a way um but um, that's not to say that i would say it's a very very different experience so i don't think i would compare that at all no and um, i i kind of i i don't I, I like I said I have seen Body Hammer a very long time ago, but I don't I don't think of Tetsuo as in the franchise. I think of it yeah. as its own oh, yeah, special thing. It's not a direct sequel either. It's, it's kind of no. like a spiritual. Success yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, so I'm gonna give Tetsuo the Iron Man a B minus for nice. now. I say for now. I I always say for now because sometimes <laughs> you know it sits with you for a while and you go actually. I absolutely love that. Go back in a year or so and you might, you know, you might find that you you love it and it might become a a Christmas watch for you. Oh, a festive (laughs) favourite. Festive (laughs) favourite. I mean, it is December tomorrow. Exactly. So, you know, I might remember it like that. Oh, yeah, I watched that. And it's it's twinkly. It's got lots of, you know. It's very twinkly. lights. (laughs) It's very twinkly. Uh, So, yeah, I'm going to give it a B minus without, um, hopefully that doesn't disappoint you too much. No, no, I think I think I, I, I expected less, so I'm I'm impressed with that that rating. I mean, I've really got a dislike or feel genuinely put out by a film to go really low. And I've done mm-hmm. that lots on this podcast. I've done that lots on this podcast. Um I'll be good to find out what Andy thought as well. Um so I'll yes. find that from mm-hmm. him, because I know he watched it this week. Um he did give me a couple of nuggets of feedback, but you know, I can't remember exactly what they were. They were quite <laughs> They weren't very straightforward, so uh, <laughs> we'll find we'll find out from Andy. Um, but yeah, that was that was Tetsuo the Iron Man. Thank you very much for joining us, Amber. It's been a it's been great. Thank you it's so much very, for having me. Very, very interesting. Yes, thank you for letting me talk. <laughs> yeah, thank you for letting me talk and ramble in length about this film. Anytime, anytime. It would be great to get you back on the show um, when Absolutely. Andy's here as well. Yeah, definitely. So that we can we can properly discuss another as i said possibly another one of your favorites or maybe some as i said maybe somebody we haven't seen before mm-hmm. um where can our listeners obviously i will put everything in the show notes that we discuss in terms of your podcast and your mm-hmm. newsletter but where can our listeners find out more from you in terms of like socials and everything like that um i am at home blood fire on everything instagram twitter and this new hive thing that everyone's i'm not using it because it never works on my phone um you can find my podcast on all the usual suspects apple and spotify um both podcasts actually uh fang bangers is not yet on apple it's just on spotify for now um you can subscribe to my newsletter that we talked about a bit earlier and my podcast which is after a long break of not having internet i am recording a new episode this friday so that will be updated soon um yeah that's pretty much me awesome lovely wonderful okay um so thank you very much for listening if you enjoyed the show become a patron over at patreon.com forward slash horror hangout thank you to our current patrons including john crinnan ben scaife stephen christopher laura kendrick toby miller lane spencer ollie child leslie carlo julia bilgren nick spill troy bursch and Pazuzu. We've currently got some new merchandise as well that we've just put live. Uh, Patron exclusive merchandise and uh, our merch store on Gumroad, which we I'll put the links to that in the in the show notes as well, which is brand new. Um, we are on all of the social media platforms, it seems now. We're all over them, including Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Thanks to Taj Easton for our theme music. Thanks to ACAST for hosting the show. Um, next week is December. It's the official December Horror Hangout lineup, which we've not even officially confirmed. So it'll be a lovely brand new surprise for you if you tune into next week's episode. Who knows what film we're going to be covering? Tetsu or Body Hammer? Maybe. Probably, <laughs> probably not. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much again, Amber. It's been, a good, it's been a good time. Thank you. And see you soon. Bye. Bye.